Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Rav Yirmiyahu, uh, and I want to take this opportunity to really say a karata talk to you because uh, I came to you uh, very early on. You were one of the first people I came to with this whole idea of the Al Sheikh Academy, and uh, you were so graceful in your advice and your support, and you immediately offered to uh, teachers, the Chokli Israel, and in fact, your shir was the very first shir in uh, the Al Sheikh Academy uh, history. And uh, uh, I'm delighted to invite you back in now to having given us six, uh, six lessons on the theory of Chokli Israel to come in and, and help us on the practical side. And I think for the viewers, I just wanted to say that. Um, this may seem a little bit different from the regular um, lessons that we have at the Al Sheikh Academy. You know, most of the times, you're sitting down and listening. You're listening to something coming in. This is the the only time where you're going to be actively doing something, and that doing, that saying the words, reading the words from the Torah, is actually a very powerful healing effect on you, on the body, and on the soul. And I encourage you, uh, as difficult it might be in, in the beginning, um, I encourage you to embrace this because as Rabbi Yirmiyahu taught us that when we go to the next world, one of the questions that will be asked is, did you allocate time for learning? And this is the minimum uh, accepted uh, view of achieving a yes for that answer. So if you want to hear how most easily to say yes to that answer, then this is how to do it. And I really encourage you to at least on the Tuesdays that we're, we're broadcasting to share with us, have a chumash open and read the Pesukim out loud with us. That's a whole exercise and that's a whole purpose. And I promise you that you will change as a person. You'll be transformed as a result of doing this through the year. So thank you. In fact, um, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here. I just want to say that um, that we're going to have it quite differently this week and next week. Um, next week will be something which will be maybe easier to follow, actually. Um, what we're going to do today, I wouldn't say it's the ideal. It's simply where I am as a person. It's a very personal thing. See, Chokli Israel is your relation to the Torah, to your relation to a writer, um, the way you relate to her, but most importantly, the way she relates to you. Okay. So for some of us, she just relates by sending a little petek and telling us, uh, you know, petty, ignorant, um, and, you know, fool. And that's all the way she relates to us. We just try to go beyond that. Okay. So it's about, it's about resilience uh, many times. And so next week, what you will have is that Reb Shlomo and, uh, and Mariuda will be exchanging, will have, a, will, uh, will have like a conversation where Mariuda will be taking the psukim in Hebrew and Shlomo will be saying them in English as a type of a targum. Because you see, when we say targum, targum means a translation. By the way, there's no such thing as targum belashon kodesh. You know, for example, you have today editions of the Zohar where you have the, you know, the, the text in Aramaic and you have also the text in Hebrew. And people say it's Targum Belashon HaKodesh. There's no such thing, you know, no such thing. Because Targum means that it's a foreign language. It's a language which isn't Hebrew. So there's no such thing as a Targum in Hebrew. On the other hand, there's such a thing as a Targum in English. Obviously, we're not going to say that what you will read in English, you know, whatever edition you will take, that it corresponds to what an onkelos would have, you know, uttered had he spoken English. Obviously not, we're not saying that. But it's a way, it's, it's a way to actually grow your practice. You know, to resonate with what Reb Shlomo was just telling us, um, you have to realize that though there is this type of, uh, of a legend that when you want to follow the ways of the Mekubalim, you want to follow the ways of the, of the inner Torah, that it would require of you more stringencies and things that are actually harder to apply. To, to apply. Well, you know, that's one of the legends that the people who didn't want you to learn it, I mean, told you, right? Obviously, because it's not to the advantage of anyone else but them. But actually, it's not true. And this is one of the best examples. Why? Because when you really follow what Diary is telling you about the way Chot Israel works, you actually obtain a type of a minimal practice which is actually more lenient 
and more easy to follow and to apply than what you would have in the usual Hotel Israel that the different editions uh, have made throughout the evolution of the Hasidut. So in other words, you know, what we're, so what I'm going to apply today is simply going to give you a glimpse at what I myself practice. I'm not saying it's the ideal. I'm not saying it's even an example. That's who I am, that's all. That's all, nothing more than that. Um, you can judge me on it. I'll be glad, I have no issue. Um, uh, just, I'm just honestly telling you where I am about it. Next week will be something where you can grow from. And actually the Psukim, part of the Psukim of the Torah, obviously, which are the Psukim of the week, but the Psukim in the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim, also when, when it relates to Mishnah, to Gemara, won't be the same as what you'll be taking next week. Why? Because I relate very profoundly to Parashat Ekev. The Ari did, and our sages do. Why? Because Parashat Ekev is all about the Achila. It's all about the eating. And about the relating to food. And in fact, we will take also the words of Arya Hatov, the Ben Ishray, who actually told us some of the, of the practice that should be even for the commoner. He says even Adam Pashut. <laughs> so he just says someone that just simple, simple man that has even just learned at school. And he, he gives a minimal practice. And for some reason, which um, I'm not here to explain that, this is very, I mean, unknown. <laughs> or at least it's uh, quietly ignored. So we're going to do it in just a few steps. And I just want to tell you that there's one step, many st steps here that I don't control. One of them, which explains, by the way, what's written in, in uh, Parashat Wait Hanan and Shah Mitzvot, uh, when the Ari explains the, the, the Chokli Israel, uh, the first time that Rabbi Chaim Vital actually observed, that is, saw his master do that, he read the Psukim from the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. And then he says that he engaged with Kabbalah and then Mishnah and Gemara. And then after that, he says, well, it doesn't seem to be the right order. So I just, you know, he doesn't know how to explain it. My master, Rav Shalom, was saying that when you are at the point of Kabbalah, it means that you are at the point of Hamutzi. That is, it means that when he had just taken the Nevim and the Ketuvim, he already had integrated this Chochmah. He was able already to, down, to do this download. And at that point, he knew that it was the point to eat. And so he related to the Mishnah and the Gemara only after as he was eating. So you never know when that download had takes place. Many times, unfortunately, it has a hard time taking place. And sometimes it only happens after you've done actually all the, you know, all the learning. All the learning I'll be doing will be at the beginning, obviously, because I'll be doing between Anitiyak Daim and Hamutsi, as was the old practice of our masters in Yeshiva Tamikubalim Betel. It will all be in Hebrew and Aramaic, but I will try to make it as short as possible. And then we will go ex explaining and talking about what is it that I was learning and what is it that concerns Parashat Ekev, eating, mindfulness, and all those subjects. Okay? Excellent. So first, I will start with my own Nitzlet Adayim, and then <coughs> you. Now, you have to understand, for me, it's a bit uncomfortable, because I, I usually don't have, when I do that at home, I usually don't have a, spe a spectator for that. You know? <laughs> my wife is a spectator, but she's with me. Amen. 
מסטר בשדה, רבי חיים שאול דוויקה כהן, וכשהוא יהיה דוויק היום, אה? משפט דוויק, אה? שוויק, לא שוויק, לא דוויק. סו המסטר, המסטר בשדה, גייבוס אין אדישן טו כוונות אבל די אכילה, He gave us even a tefillah. And if we have enough time, I'll even show you what the tefillah is. Is it tefillah for as you're eating? You see, you have obviously different interventions in the Torah where one is eating. One of them, which is the most profound one, is as Avram Avinu is eating with the angels. But that's because the angels accepted him and accepted to eat with him. You also have a famous case where the angels refused to eat. And that famous case is Manoach, the father of Shimshon. And the Gemara I just took from the, the very holy Amora Rav Nachman, It says, Manoach Amar Etz Haya. It says he was, um, he was an ignorant. He was an Amar Etz. And that is the explanation which is usually given to tell us that's the reason that, you know, the angels, the angel, in this case, was not ready to, to eat with him. But actually, the Gemara goes much deeper into the Inyan. It says, Matkif le Rav Nachman Baitzrak. So, Rav Nachman Baitzrak, another Rav Nachman, actually is objecting to this. He says, That's, how, how can he, you know, how can it be, how can it be that he wasn't ignorant? And you see, Rav Nachman originally explains, it says, why is he an ignorant? How do we know he's an ignorant? Because he went after his wife. So in other words, he walked after his wife and he says, look, um, he was an ignorant because of that. That shows he was an ignorant. That's a sign he was an ignorant. And Rav Nachman Baitzrak says, well, I object to that. Why? Because Gabel Kana Adirtiv Royelech El Kana Achare Ishto. Elkanah went after his wife. Now, by the way, do you know this pasuk? Elkanah? Do you know about this pasuk? I know about 
וילך על קנה אחרי אשתו? There is such a פסוק? No, there is such a פסוק. But that's not the matter. That doesn't matter. You see, what we're talking about here, and that's what the Chok Yisrael is all about. It's about not just oral tradition. It's about enacting the oral tradition. It's about enabling the oral Torah. It's about letting you be part of that process. And part of it can come where you would actually download something which isn't even written. It doesn't matter. It didn't bother anyone inside the Gemara that the date that. No one. <laughs> Only the Baliyah Tosafot later on said, maybe we should take this away from the Gemara because there's no such pasuk, you know? So like, <laughs> the embarrassment, come on, you know? I mean, <laughs> you're trying to cite a pasuk that doesn't exist? What is this? But the tradition given by the Ari is that that's not a problem. Why? Because you see, What takes place is that you need to be part of this downloading process where you actually bring down the wisdom. And bringing down the wisdom is not obviously to say something which differs or so differently than what you know, we have a Torah saying, but it's actually to allow what the Torah was saying to <coughs> have a further throw. And so The, the Gemara continues and says, Achin Ami, now a pasuk that does, that does exist. Wagabe Elisha dirti vayakom oyeler hareya. Right? And Elisha went after her. He rose, arose, and followed her. It says, Achin Ami, isn't it? This is the same. So what? You're going to say that Elisha that was an ignorant? You know? Just like Manoah. How does it work? You know? What's the matter? Why is it that you can say about Manoah such a thing following this Pasuk and you can't say it about Elisha? How does it work? And so the Gemara continues and says, Ela hare devareha wat sata. Only it really that he followed, he went after her words and her advice. Achanami hare devareha wat sata. He says, here also with Manoah, you should understand that actually it means that he went after her words and advice. Okay, let's stop one instant. So you're telling me that because he went after her word and her advice, he's an ignorant, he's an Amaret, because that's, that's what it means then, right? So the Gemara fortunately continues and tells us, Amar Rav Ashi, Ulemai da Amar Rav Nachman, Manoach Amaret, Sahirayim. He says, according to what Rav Nachman said, that Manoach was an ignorant. Afilu be Rav Nami lo kara. It seems that Indeed, he had not even learned, like, you know, what, what is considered as, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, a school uh, children, uh, ch- children, you know, what the, what the children that go to school have learned. Why? He says, Dirtiv, Watakom, Rivka, Wenaroteha, Wutirkavna, Al Hagemalim, Watelachna, Hareha Ish. And she went after the man. So in other words, it clearly tells you that Rivka knew this principle and she made sure to go after whom? Eliezer. Eliezer. And not have him go after her. She knew that that's the natural way, that's the way of things. Well, not in front of the man. Amar Rebbe Yochanan, Ahare Ari, Welo Ahare Isha. אחרי אישה ולא אחרי עבודת כוכבים. אחרי עבודת כוכבים ולא אחרי בית הכנסת בשעה שמתפעלים. Very, very strong statement. Gives, gives an audio of preferences. It tells you, better go behind a lion, but not behind a woman. Behind a woman, but not behind an idol. I mean, literally, is Avodat Kohavim, so the worshipping of the stars. So in other words, behind Avodat Zarah, Mamash. By the way, there's a version of this Gemara that says Avodat Zarah, not Avodat Kohavim. And it says, then it changes, it says, instead of Ahare, it says Ahore, behind, see, in order not to say after. <laughs> it says, Ahore Avodat Kohavim, Velo Ahore Bet HaKneset Beshash It says, behind the, the worshipping of idols, and not behind a synagogue where they are praying. Now, it tells you how you should relate to things. And, and I'm going to tell you why I'm saying relate. 
Because you see, the problem when you would be walking behind a woman, even behind your own wife, is that instead of having a relation where you're facing her and you actually both relate to each other, you see her, but she's not looking at you. So you can be thinking whatever you're thinking about her, but she's, she just, you know, is in a way a victim of you, of your own thoughts. So what is it that instead of having an interacting with, interaction where it's something fair, you know, one is actually relating to each other. And, and, why, and why is it applied, was it applied to what is written here? Because you see, the lion, you have to be a fool to go behind the lion, because you never know when he's going to, when is he going to like, turn around, right? And, 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 cha and possibly chase you. So the matter is about what is it that you expect that the person is not going to turn around, you see? Because if you go after a lion, it's that you expect that you actually could follow the lion and he will do whatever he does and, uh, you know, and you'll be a stalker, basically. You know, you'll, be, you'll be looking you know, after the lion and the lion has ignores you. Well, it's exactly the matter about your wife, you see? You shouldn't be here going after her in the sense of you're just you know, relating to her, but you don't give her a chance to actually relate to you. And it goes the same matter here about the example about the Beta Knesset. Why? Because you see, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a very beautiful practice, which is mentioned in the Zohar, and, and mentioned and explained at the very beginning of Shara Kavanot. Diari tells us that when you come in a Beta Knesset, you are actually taking counsel with Abraham Yitzhak and Yaakov you're actually taking counsel with our fathers. And you see, and how does it relate to what we've been doing here? Because you see, Lechem is 638. And it's actually Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov. Mm -hmm. And you actually are here to engage. Now here, it's a, it's a double engagement because you see, one came in this bit of Knesset. And obviously, if I tell you that, I know that it's part of our practice of relating to the Gdusha of the Betaknesset. Now, how do you come to inside the Betaknesset? You come showing your back? Obviously not, you know what I mean? That is, you actually, and what do you get when you come in? You see her back? No. You see, you see, your front, you're normally coming directly and seeing the Aron Kodesh. See, it's actually, you're relating to the Gdusha here. You're relating to the, to, to, you know, to the Betaknesset. In fact, in Shara Kavanot, Diary explains that the way to relate to the Gdusha of Beta Knesset is understanding what, is rema what remains of Gdusha in, in the Kotel. So you have, you know, it's, it's a process that, you know, that requires quite some experience, quite some, some will, as always. Now we have a big question here. I mean, we should ask us a question. Weren't we under the impression that Abraham was told to, by Akashbo who listened to your wife? Mm -hmm. And this has become, you know, a part of the Jewish lore. You know, you prepare Hatanim and you tell them, you know, that's one of the principles. You know, Akashbo who told Abraham, you know, listen to your wife. But the ones who are telling you that are making a very, very big shortcut. <laughs> and it's not a nice shortcut because it's forgetting a few psukim earlier. You know, in Parashat Bereshit, what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu tell us? Right? You listen to her voice. <laughs> so what is this thing, you know? So on one hand, we're telling, we're telling Chatanim, you know, make sure to listen to your wife's voice. But on the other hand, look, the first example in the Torah is a terrible example, so, you know, so what type of advice is that? With Adam and Eve. Yes. You know, Adam and Hawa, he clearly listened to his wife, and that's the same term, same terms used. Only there's a difference, by the way. There's a difference that we usually don't, usually don't pay attention to. Is that you see, concerning Adam and Hawa, it's written exactly, just to make sure that I'm, it's written, it says lekol. Well, as you see, Avram and Sarah, it says shma bekola. 
So first we have to understand what is the difference between Bicola and Licola. You see, when we translate in English, we say two her voice, and two is li. So we're used only to that type of listening. And frankly, if that's the advice you give, you know, to Khatanim, well, it's a very bad advice. Because to listen to her voice is literally what's written concerning uh, Adam and Hawa, you know. So, you know, so, it's just, so don't listen. But then what does it mean when you say, you know, Bekola? Well, you have, a, you have a beautiful Midrash in Yalkut Shemeoni. You know, there, there are many Midrashim I, I love, but Yalkut Shemeoni is one of my, uh, you know, beloved. Uh, Yalkut Reuvni is even more beloved by me, but still. So, but Yalkut Shemeoni is obviously older than Yalkut Reuvni. And so Yalkut Shemeoni in two places actually treats those two verses as concerning four types of listeners and understanding that you obviously have two of those types inside those psukim. And so he says, you have the one who listens and is rewarded by God. One who listens and who does not listen, sorry, and is rewarded by God in any way. One who does not listen and loses. And one who listens and loses. Now, the two examples we gave that involves a husband listening to his wife, obviously, was about Adam and Chava and Avram and Sarah. But before we actually even talk about this, we have to realize anyone who's telling you that you have this thing of Avraham being told by Akash Baruch Hu to listen to a voice forgets that a parasha earlier, you already had this. But not Akash Baruch Hu telling Avraham to listen to his wife. It says that Abraham, of his own accord, himself, you know, of his own will, actually listened to her. Pay attention to that. And at what point is that? Well, you see, it's at the point that Sarah is telling him, look, obviously there's a problem with me. <laughs> there's a problem with us. We need the help of this Hagar. And maybe, you know, she says to him, Ulai, she says, maybe she will give you a child. And there it's written, So this thing was already written, but pay attention, it was not written, it was written, So it shows us that it's not that it's always a negative thing, you see? But you know, Avram and Sarah are exceptions. That is, when I say that Avram and Sarah are really, you know, in the, in the deeper understanding of things. In fact, you have um, even Gemara that are here to tell you that Abraham and Sarah are not of a, of a human in nature. You know, they are of something which is, which is more akin to the divine than to what we know. So can you actually take Abraham and Sarah and actually say, you know, that, that's the rule? The other thing is that it's not that it tells you there's a rule, such a rule. Akar who told Abraham, listen. And at what point did he tell her, listen to your wife? He told her that at the point that this very thing that he listened to at the beginning, which was taking Hagar as a wife, having a child, well, the whole thing started to rot, right? And things started to become quite complicated. And it's at that point, it's at that point that Sarah, it's at that point that Sarah is actually telling Avram, Remove her. Remove her. You know, Garesh. Remove her. Remove yourself from her. Remove yourself from her. Remove yourself from her son. Remove yourself. And at that point, which obviously didn't seem to make much sense with what he listened to at the very beginning, that, you know, she would maybe give him a child, etc. At that point, Akash Baruch told him, listen to your wife. So that's a very, it's a very different matter. B. 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 And that's when he listens to her advice to get married to the other wife and it turns sour? No. Well, that's at the point that Akash Baruch Hu tells him when things got, got worse sour already, you know, and he tells him, look, he listens to your wife because she's telling, what she's telling you to remove her is the right thing. And that's his second B. B, yes. Okay. yes. And by the way, in the whole Torah, there isn't any use of a usage concerning the feminine, Bikola. 
There's no usage of Bekol, Bekol Ishtecha, Bekola. There's no such usage apart for this. So it's a very unique, very unique instance in the Torah. So, you know, it's always, it's always amusing when you start taking something which is a very unique instance where very unique individuals were like Baruch who gave himself giving the order and you speak of it, you know. <laughs> you know, it didn't, say, it didn't say, talk to Bnei Israel and tell them, listen to your wife, you know. <laughs> it didn't say that. So, we're having very different stories here. And just to finish what Yalkut Shimeoni was saying, um, the idea of the Yakut Shimoni is to tell us, well, you see, Abraham listened to his wife. Um, but that's because Akash Baruch told him to do that. And it gave him to actually remove the problem in his home, which was Agar. And it gave him the reward of having Yitzchak. See, so it's a, it's, you know, it's a very different story. Whereas concerning Adam and Chawa, uh, you know, and he, he listened to his wife and they lost together the ability to have, a, to have humans live forever. Okay, so yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very different dynamic. It's Bekola, yes, yes. So first, how do you understand the difference between Lekola and Bekola, by the way? So Lekola is really where you actually go after what she tells you and you just do it. Whatever she tells you, you just do. Bekola is that you integrate her voice in the discourse, in the conversation. You integrate it in your decision making, in, in, in how you actually look at things. You don't dismiss it, you integrate it. You see, that's, that's the matter. And that's why it says, you know, you, it, you could say, listen to her in the sense of, of you know, uh, consider what she's telling you. Integrate it. Don't uh, don't dismiss it. Does that mean don't take it literally? Sorry. Don't take it literally, or no? It means it, it, it means don't take it as being alaha. <laughs> don't being take it as the way to go. Take it as a very important point to relate to. And as we said, at that point, what are you doing? You're having your wife walk in front of you? No, you are facing her. You 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 listen to her. But you listen to her in knowing to, you know, respond to her. It's it's not it's not having you know just uh, an LED that goes only in one direction. You know, electricity only flows in one way. It it allows you know this interaction. Can you say that if your wife says I'm fine, Lekola would say would mean yeah she's fine. Vekola, no she's not fine. Well, I. I'll tell you after why I wouldn't say that. So, so what is the idea here that we have about you know Manoir? Because you see, we've made of him almost like the the the, the perfect uh, ignoramus, you know, this perfect this, pe this perfect uh, ignorant, uh, you know. So why is he even mentioned by his name? You know, by the way, his wife, his name is not given. It's it's given only in Divrei Yamim and Sadim Midrashim, but but it's not mentioned directly in Sefer Shoftim. So how is it that you would say that, you know, Manoach is this ignorant? His wife, by the way, is the one who obtained the revelation of the Malach in the first place, right? And it's because of her own sensitivity and her whole ability to actually relate to any of this that this became possible, you know? But yet her name is not mentioned. His name is mentioned, but he's the ignorance. So it's, it's, how is it possible that it really works like that? You see, Diari takes this in Shara Mitzvot, and he brings one more layer into it, and he tells you that he was really an ignorant. And you say, well, in what way is it a new layer? Well, the one who went out of the state of being an ignorant, and of being what we call klal arur, that is this generality of being cursed, to that of being blessed, and being even called blessed of God, Beru Hashem. Who is? Eliezer, Eved Abraham. And Eliezer went from that state of Namares to actually one who is re removing from himself this state of Arur, of cursed, to being blessed. 
In fact, you should know that that's one of the secrets of the, of the brachot. It's one of the secrets of, uh, of why you say ata between Baruch and Hashem. And if you want to learn more of this, then you'll have to, to come to me because obviously we won't have enough time to talk about this. We have about 10 minutes and I would like to explain something very important here. Diari says that Manoah on the other hand mastered something. That most of you don't master. And by transitivity, it would make all of you ignorant. And what is it? It says that his name, Manoah, was made of two concepts that are bind together. One which is called Mu, and the other called Nach. Memoir, Munhet, together, as they bind together Manoah. And what are those two concepts? Those two concepts are related, related to the kawana of the Akhila, the intention in eating. So you tell me, oh, so he wasn't ignorant after all, was he? You know, <laughs> like, my goodness, he, he's able, he understands the kawana to have when one eats and he's cool and ignorant? Yes, because he didn't have the second level, which is the level where you relate to the neshamot that are in reincarnation in the food. The neshamot that are through or as a whole, or more as, you know, more likely as nitzotzot, as parts of that neshama, I would say who are, instead of which are, who are inside the food. And as you eat, what takes place? Well, there are two processes. There is one which is about doing this separation between what is it that your body needs and what is it which is superfluous that in any way you will reject later on. You know, and at the point of another, two brachot, by the way, uh, which are, you know, uh, at the point that you go where the king goes and all. And here is actually something wondrous, why? Because what you say in Bracha, which is the second Bracha, what do you say? You say, Uma Fila Asot. You finish it with Uma Fila Asot. But the term Uma Fila Asot is a unique term to Sefer Shoftim with the story of Manoah, his wife, and the Malach. It's actually knowing to relate to an end process which involves what? Involves the refua, the healing, that not only your body needs, but that the world needs. And my friend, I saw it is used in Sefer Shoftim to say that as the malach refused to eat with them, and he went up in the flames of that fire, the sight of this was wondrous. And that is the umafila sot. Just telling you how much your end of your bracha, of your berkat asher yatsar, should be of the greatest experience and not something that you get rid of. Now, so why did the malach refuse to eat with Manoah if he had that? And he ate with Avram Avinu because you see Avram Avinu mastered this second level of Kavanata Achila, of the way of eating. What was the, what is the second level? The second level is when you actually relate, as we said, to the Neshamot, where the Neshamot that are in reincarnated in the food, you actually relate to them. You actually engage with them. You see, eating is not a process that like we're doing now. You know, I only have a few seconds to actually do what is the process of eating here. Why? Because eating is silent. You are not supposed to be in a conversation with others around the table as you eat. And it's actually a very beautiful Torah in uh, Maseret Tanit, Dafit Mudbet. And it says, Rav Nachman ribitz hakahu yadveh Bisudata. They were sitting at a meal. Amarle Rav Nachman le Ribitzrak 
למה אמר מילתא? So Rav Nachman told Rav Yitzhak, he told him, you know, same some, some words of Torah, you know? The typical thing. You know, when was the last time you were in a Siuda and someone told you that? That's always happening all the time. But not everyone has that level of Rav Yitzhak. You know, Rav Yitzhak. By the way, you know, in the, in the Torah, when it's written in the, the Gemara, it's Alev Resh you know, for the Ari. We had the scale of Diari just a few days ago. And so Diari, it's <coughs> Amar Rabbi you know, So here it is. And so what does, he, what does uh, Rabbi Yitzchak say? He says, Achi Amar Rabbi Yohanan, En Masihen Bisuda. One should not talk during a meal. Shema Yagdim Kane La Weshet. We have all Lide Sakana. He says, lest... The, you know, the, the windpipe and the footpipe, you know, the trachea and the esophagus, that there would be an inversing of holes and one would actually precede the other, which would obviously, uh, you know, come to a danger. But you see, that's a very, very, very deep talk. Because the Arin Sharab Sukim tells us that there is such matters spiritually as called the Kane and the Weshet. See, he tells you, we all heard about what would be the equivalent, you know, in question of topology between certain sefirot and the way that we are built as humans. So you would have ideas between what are the legs, what are the arms, you know, what is the bust, etc. And the Ari asks us the question. And Sharab Sukim, he says, but on the other hand, we have such a profound Torah about the integration of Mohin through the Garon, through the thought. But what does the thought correspond to? And what is the thought made of? And you have different conduits. And so what do they correspond to? And there he explains, and I, I won't make it a very long story because we only have about five minutes left, but... Um, you said we entered quarter past ten. Oh, we can have, okay. So Diary explains and says, that you have three sarim in the story of Yosef. You know, Parashat Yeshev is the ninth parasha from the beginning. And you know what is the ninth parasha to the end of the Torah? Parashat Ekev. And Parashat Ekev, Ekev itself, the term itself is this 172, you know, which is the Gematria of 172, which is two times Shem Elohim. <coughs> It corresponds to two of the Sarim. You see, you have three Sarim in the story of Yosef. You have the cupbearer, you have the baker, you have the guardian of the guards or the chief of the guards. But in Hebrew, we have, you know, very precise terms for that. It's Sarah Mashkim, Sarah Ophim, Sarah Tabahim. Sar, Sar, the prince of... It's interesting that because, you know, uh, one doesn't like those type of concepts and you look at all the translations, they won't tell you the prince of, you know, they won't because it's like, what do you mean prince of, it's such a thing. So they'll tell you the chief of, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but they won't, you know, never no one had said chief, you know, they said sap. And so what is it that you relate to actually as you eat? Well, you are in this position where, just like Manoah wanted to eat with the Malach, you are relating to two of the three Sarim. <coughs> you are relating to what gives you the Mashke. You know, what gives you the water, but more likely the wine. And what gives you the bread? It's Sarah Mashkin, Sarah Ophim. These are the two times Shem Elohim that make you Ekev. And one is, corresponds to the Kane, which is Sarah Mashkin. And one corresponds to the Veshet, which is Sarah Ophim. What's Kane? Kane is the Trachea, uh -huh. and Veshet is the Osephagus. And so Osephagus is the one who takes the food, and, and the cane and the, and the trachea is what takes the air. And it's considered that 
that Sar Amashkim is the one corresponding to the windpipe, whereas Sar Aofim is corresponding to the footpipe. And you don't want them to have one preceding the other. Now, if you want to learn the Kavanot of that, and I relate to Kavanot Achila, I'll invite you to learn with us on the, on the, on the Shabbat morning. Uh, but because I'm not going to like detail more of that, because obviously it's a very, very deep matter. But what about, you know, the very, very rudimentary level of things? So first you have what the Ben Yishrei told us, where himself he, told, he said, Vechol elu kavanot. So even before we said the kavanot, I just want you to listen to what he says about them. Pshutot hand, they are simple. With srichot me'od afilu le adam pashut, and they are needed even for a simple man. With sarir shekol adam yodea sefer le argil atzmo bahen, and it is necessary that anyone who actually just knows a book, in other words, he knows to read, okay, that he would be accustomed to them. Okay? And this is, you know, don't forget, this is not a sefer where the Ben Yishrai wrote this, like, uh, uh, with some, uh, some type of drashot, you know, of different levels on the Torah. And it's not even his drasha on Parashat Shelach Lecha on the Shana Rishona. It's actually part of the Alacha Rishona. So what he says here is actually Alacha Le Maase. Okay? Just, just to integrate what this is. This is not, there's nothing optional about this. He says like this. Techawan be'em sher zman achilatcha. You should have the 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 kavana, the intention, as you are eating. Ulefachot kesheata ochel ota prusa shel kazait asher berachta leha hamutzi. To the very minimum, as you take this kazait of your bread on which you did, he said hamutzi that you would actually, even on that, just on that, that you would have this kavanah. And what he says? He says, kavanah ksara derech klal. He says, a very a short kavanah through, you know, a generality, a principle, a general principle. Vezuhi. Ki hine inyan haberur hu al yede lamed bet shinaim. He says, the berur that you do in the food, you see, and what is this berur? The first matter of berur is actually to make the separation between what is it that you are going to benefit from, that your body needs, and what are the things that you are going to reject. He tells you that that berur is happening, not first happening, it is happening, all of it spiritually, through your 32 teeth. That is it actually happening in your mouth, and that should be your intention. That is, as you are chewing, as you know, you know, everyone, our grandmothers, you know, our mothers, everyone told us, you know, chew, chew your food, right? Well, they were telling you a Kabbalistic teaching, and they were saying something very, very profound that our sages have been telling us for a long time. And of course, when you chew your food, how can you be talking at the same time, you know? <laughs> now, um, Terribly impolite. <laughs> so, Shehem Keneged Lamed Bet Netivot Chochma Amevarerin Hakol. He says it's it's actually using the free to uh, paths of wisdom that are doing all this extraction work. What are they? They are the thirty-two Shmot Elokim in Maase Bereshit, and I invite you to go relate to them. You know, many people tell me, what is that? I said, well, don't you read the Torah? So when you'll come, you know, to Parashat Bereshit, you know, this, uh, this coming year, when you will come, you know, and there and relate to it, I invite you to take this. Even just start by giving them a number. You know, it's the first way of, of relating to things. First, you know, first one, look, this is the first Shem Lokim. This is the second. This is the third. Know to see where they are. Relate them. Don't run on them. Each one of them, is actually a path of wisdom. And each one of them corresponds to your 32, 32 teeth. Now, without making that parallel, you know, and again, it's the Ben Yishrei who tells you, you have to relate to that. That's for the Adam Pashut. This isn't elaborated matter. He's telling you, this is not advanced. This is Judaism 101. This is, this is about eating 101 in Judaism. That's the way it works. And he says, 
when he cites for the Zohar, it says, in through the thought is this extraction, this separation, all of it is happening. They are what actually grinds and separates the food. And actually through that is the separation with the refuse, with what you will not want. He's telling you, without you know, giving all the details of this, but he's telling you that actually you have, you know, the sigim. So in other words, it's the things that are, you know, not as what you want, not what you want. And you have what actually will nourish you. And you shouldn't, you know, the, the, the Ari is very clear in Parashat Ekev, Parashat this week, that's why we're taking this. The Ari is very clear that you should refuse that role of your digestive system, that exclusivity to your digestive system. You shouldn't accept that your digestive system is the one doing the work. You should refuse that you will count on it and that it will do what it, what it has to do. You should actually already uh, precede the digestive system and use your intention through your thoughts of thinking, okay, what is it I'm taking here? What is it that I'm eating? What good can it do to me? And you actually use the grinding with your teeth together with that simple thought, that very simple thought to actually actionate spiritually what your teeth can do with the food and not count on the digestive system to take care of it. Digestive system is to take care of what you were not able to take care of. <laughs> but spiritually, you are doing it for your teeth. It's a very fundamental and a very simple Torah of Diary. But it's actually what makes real mindful eating. It says, removing the shells from the fruit, removing the shells from the actual food. He says, actually what counts as being the Kali, which counts as being the shells, is actually together with the food at the point that you take the food in your mouth. It's not separated. He says, Ad kan lishono, ve'od katuf sham lechawen bishte bechinot shel beruch be'ma'achal shochel, ve'hu ha'echad hu ha'beruch ha'ma'achal be'atzmo. Okay, and so that's the one of Manoach, which is basically doing the separation of the ma'achal itself. Ha'tof shebu min asigim amoravim bo. He says what is good about it and what is actually not needed and which is mixed with it. Al het adam rishon. And so he tells you why is there such a thing as food and your food something that you actually don't need? Why is it such a thing that you will actually need to evacuate it and you will have rachot on it? Why is it? It's because that comes from the head of Adam Arishon, from him listening to his wife. <laughs> See, that comes from there. That's, that's uh, the origin of it. You know, uh, we, we don't know the reality without it, so it would be hard for us to talk about how would it be without it. But it the says mana, the mana was already there. The, the the mana was at that level exactly. But but it, but it's hard for us. We we have not known. I mean, not ourselves, not our prison selves in this incarnation. We have not known nor the mana nor the time of obviously of Adam and Chawa before the chet. It says vegam od mashayah meorav bahem mitchilat briat misheshet yeme bereshit vasheni. So he says that also from what actually was from the first six days of creation, what was included inside that food that comes from there. He says, now it's after the tikkun, it's the preparation of the souls that are actually in reincarnated in the food. And that, I told you, this is actually the Kavana of Avraham Avinu. This is the thing which is beyond. This is the thing which is beyond. So one is not expecting of you to actually relate to that. Though, there is one thing where you do relate to it. You know, and we have the, our great 
Ram Fetaya, Rabbi Yoda Moshe Fetaya in, uh, in Baghdad, who said this beautiful thing in, in Sefer, uh, in um, Sefer Minchat Yehuda, he explains, uh, by the way, on Parashat Ekev, again, on this parasha, taking from the words of the Ari, he explains that neshamot that are integrated in you as you actually eat, because, you know, let's, let's put it this way, if you had a full which is not something which is happening the whole time. But if you had, imagine you have this cucumber and that you had a full neshama in it, a full neshama reincarnated in that cucumber. At the point that you actually eat the cucumber, what happens? For this neshama, it's a gilgul. Why? Because it went from the state of being in tzemach, in being in the vegetal realm, to actually being integrated in you. And you are high medaber. You are actually a being with the ability to talk. And what happens at that point? It actually depends on you. Not only for the Beruch, which is this very high level that Abraham Avinu was, was new to apply, but it counts on the Chochmah that comes out of your mouth. And it wants to know that actually this Chochmah is not something that it already obtained before. It's not something which was trivial for it. It needs to have something coming out of your mouth which shows that you are this worthy being of having this Neshama incarnated in you. Are you? Are you this worthy being? Now the Ari says this that the Ham Fetaya cites. He says when the Neshama finds out that you are not this worthy being, it's it revenges, it takes vengeance upon you and causes you to sin. That's what the Hamfetaya says. In fact, the Hamfetaya explains that when people come to, you know, come to, come to sin or come to do something wrong, most of the times it comes from them having eaten something. It's just the way that you have food poisoning, you have poisoning of your soul because you are not worthy, you do not relate to wisdom in a way where a neshama which is integrated inside you can benefit from. The second thing that Ham Fetaya says is that when such a neshama actually has been inside you, not only is very disappointed by you, it actually is in a state after that which is worse than the state it was before. In other words, that you actually have damaged this neshama. So, of course, my master had this very interesting uh, statement. He was saying, do the world a favor, stop eating. Um, and <laughs> do the world a favor and stop eating, um, which was a way of saying, you know, you don't know how to say your brachot rishonot correctly, you know, your brachot not. you don't even know how to eat. There's not even wisdom coming out of your mouth. You know, like, come on, seriously, like, give the, you know, give the world a break, you know, like, my goodness, look what you're doing to all this nishamat and to all of this. And, you know, it's very true. It's very true. Now, of course, can you apply it? Well, it's not always easy. Though a bit of fasting doesn't doesn't hurt. Uh, but the point we're having here, just to come back to our you know our initial learning. So, what is one supposed to do? What concerns you know Manoah? What concerns you know listening to one's wife? It's knowing to integrate, knowing to integrate all those voices. But you don't integrate them by adding more voices. You don't integrate them by, you know, by adding more speech and more conversation. No, you have actually a meal. You eat it in silence. You actually relate to things deeply. You, in the same way that you would know to take counsel when you enter a Beta Knesset and take counsel with Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, you also know to take counsel with where you are situated in life where things are at, you know? And when it says, you know, listen to her voice, well, obviously it was specifically to Abraham and concerning Sarah, but it's about knowing to go beyond that step of what was cited concerning Manoah, which is just, she's going there, I go after her. She's saying like this, I just do that. No, you, you know to take a voice, integrate it, you know, be mindful about it and actually use, use this, this step of eating as a way to allow 
not only this integration of one, one told you, but actually going after the real voice, going after the real beautiful maiden who is Oraita. That is, you see, you are supposed to go not literally after your wife, but you are supposed to go after Oraita. You're supposed to follow her. What she tells you to do, you do. So you know to integrate all those voices and understand where is the voice of Oraita in that. So this meditative um, relation to eating is not only about doing this separation of the good and the bad in your food through your teeth as you actually grind it. And by the way, the, 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 the Benishrai in ending this halacha is telling you, well, you know, and for those who actually lost teeth or, you know, they don't have the 32, he says, he actually explains why even as long as you have still one left, you know, as long as you have just even a little bit left, it actually has the same action as all the 32. So just in case someone has the excuse of telling you, well, I don't have the 32, so anyway, you know. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even the bench I thought about that. Our eating, you know, informs our download of wisdom. And that's the main message. And that's why the old practice was to include the Chokli Israel as an introduction to the Birkat Amosi. If you heard the words that I that I employed in Aramaic, it says, we said, we will not establish, we will not put together a suda as long as it has not been given from the house of the king. And then once you have a bit of that download happening, you says, now that came the time when actually, when after I witnessed the moment where it's been given from the house of the king, from here, from, you know, now onward, we will actually establish a Sibuda. Parashat Ekev is knowing to relate you know, to, to different aspects of things. It starts with your, obviously, Bracha Rishana, it ends with your Bracha Rona, but also has this middle part, which is about your eating. And you know, just one last element concerning the Bracha Rishana, we all say the Bracha Shakon Yamidvaro, but we forget that there was this beautiful explanation given by Diari about what is Shakon Yabidvaro. And saying that what is Bidvaro? It's in his creative words, the creative words of God, the, the, you know, the, the words of God that allowed the creation. All of it was already there in those words of creation. And they, is it, what, it is what we feed from. That is the spirituality we want to be fed from in the food. For example, we take a drink. You know, you say shakon yibet also on chocolate, and as we know, Ben Shray himself was saying that if you instead of siuda and you have not drank, that his father was having this minhag of actually taking the chocolate and uh, and actually saying shakon yibet on it because it obviously will include also the drinking. And what? So what, what, do you correspond, what do you relate to? You relate to the spirituality which is contained in that food and that spirituality actually stems from the very moment of creation. And that's what is meant in Parashat Ekev when it says man should not live on bread alone but on, on, on what comes out of the mouth of God. And of saying, well, the, yeah, that's what we do. We actually, you know, from the from the words of creation that came out of the word of the mouth of God, this is what actually nourishes us, and that is what justifies uh, together with Parashat Mishpatim, the Bracha Rishon. And Chokli And Chokli Israel, obviously. Hazak Baruch. Thank you.